Tyler, we got Jonathan on the line. What do you want to ask him? What kind of pivots do you see from 2022 to 2023? It's a great question. So we're starting to see the Fed level off on rates. So we're less concerned about things like floating rate debt, retrades from lenders, stuff like that, that we were last year. I think a lot of it today is, first of all, getting sellers at expectations of where today's prices are. Last mm -hmm. year, it was extremely difficult, almost impossible. Now it's possible. You just got to find the right deal. Hey, I'm Brian Briscoe, host of the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast. And this podcast is different from everything else out there. I bring together new and aspiring investors on each and every episode and let the aspiring investors ask the questions that they need answered. And if you're an aspiring investor yourself, you probably have the same questions. So before you get to this episode that we have prepared for you, make sure you hit the subscribe button and that little notification bell to make sure you get notified every time we post a new episode. And now enjoy the show. Welcome to the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briscoe with Streamline Capital Group. Got a very special episode for you today. I know I say that every time, but I really, really mean it this time. We've got our third time guest and a good friend of mine, Jonathan Nichols on the line with us as an experienced investor. And we got Tyler Smith on the line as our aspiring investor today. So guys, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate you. Yeah, absolutely. So Jonathan, third time on the podcast, you came on as an aspiring investor. You came on to talk about a first deal probably about a year ago. And now you're here as an experienced investor. So I'm excited to see what's gone on in the last, you know, since since your your first deal and see where things have gone. So let's talk about you. Give us a, a rundown of who you are, where you come from, and then we'll talk about recent history, man. Yeah, absolutely, Brian. I'll try to make it short and sweet. So yeah. my wife, Paula, and I, we started investing in real estate together shortly mm -hmm. after we got married almost six years ago. And initially, we, we started on the path that many people do, which is buying single family residential properties. Yep. We decided to use those for, for short term rentals and actually mm -hmm. kind of scaled out a short term rental business over a couple of years, okay. but eventually realized, hey, this isn't going to build the business that we really are dreaming of. And so we started talking to some people at our local RIA meetup and mm -hmm. found out that the full time investors were all in multifamily. Yeah. And so he said, hey, there's got to be something we're missing here. And so we begin to learn about apartment investing, mm -hmm. learn about multifamily together going on probably about three and a half years ago. Yep. Spent about six to 10 months, somewhere in that range. I don't remember mm -hmm. trying to figure out all the pieces ourselves, right? Yeah. Trying to learn how to underwrite, how to find deals, how to find investors. And we worked really hard at it, but eventually realized we needed mentorship to get us over the finish line on yep. that first deal. And as you already know, we joined Michael Blanc's program. That's, yep. of course, how we met you. That's where we met. Yep. Yeah. And after about, I think, eight or nine months in that program, did mm -hmm. our first deal. I always tell everyone that the law of the first deal, it's a real thing. Because yep. we closed our first deal on a Thursday and we signed our PSA for our second one the next day on Friday. Oh. So it really does, you know, get the snowball it's, rolling. It's amazing, you know, how much difference it is as a closer. I remember after getting our first deal, like like a week before we closed on our first deal, I took a screenshot of our, our bank account for the syndication. You know, it had a, a seven mm. figure number in there and I sent it to all the brokers that had kind of, you know, given us the Heisman. And I said, <laughs> look, guys. We can freaking close. We're closing on this property soon. And all of a sudden, I started getting calls from those guys. Every single one of them picked up the phone and called me in the next couple of days. It, yeah, that law of the first deal, it's real. It is. So Absolutely. And, you know, we continued on. That was, let's say, early 2021. By the end of 2021, I'd left my W-2. And then we hit 2022 last year, <laughs> yep. which, was, which was a bit of a downhill. You know, I tell everyone we only did one syndication last year, but mm -hmm. it was a really good one. And that's yep. what's important. Yeah. And obviously, because we we typically do 506B deals, I don't talk about anything that we could be possibly working on right now, but let's just say 2023 is off to a much better start. So, <laughs> good, um, good. We're yeah. really excited about this year ahead. Mm -hmm. So that's our that's our story in a nutshell. All right. Awesome. So let's talk about kind of that transition. I mean, what at what time... Were you comfortable leaving Bell? And what was going through your mind when you were about ready to make that transition? 
Yeah, it's funny. I think one of the best analogies that, that I like to use, Brian, is, you know, I knew that I wanted to leave my job, like yeah. most syndicators, right? Mm -hmm. But it's always that question of, of when do I do it? When do I take off? And I think of it as like an airplane going down a runway on takeoff, right? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. your goal is to fly, but there's kind of this thing of, okay, when do I pull back? When am I going mm -hmm. fast enough? But sooner or later, you're running out of runway. Yeah. And so for me, at the time when I left, I was working my full-time job. We had an eight unit property that we had completely vacated and mm -hmm. we're doing a full rehab on the whole thing and converting it to a short term rental. Yep. And we were in the middle of an acquisition on a $10 million property mm -hmm. for a multifamily syndication. And I was not sleeping because yeah. I had so much work. So for me, that's when I had to pull back and take off. It was like, okay, it's mm -hmm. now or never. I've got to go. So my advice would be, you know, hold on as long as you can, but there'll yeah. come a time when you're like, can't go anymore. And then you just have to have to go for it. Yeah, I I agree. You know, it, it's I mean, not that I normally disagree with you, but I, I got to the point in, in my my job was a little different. I, I had a certain date, you know, I, I couldn't leave before. But the last six months for me were extremely painful because I didn't want to be at work. I was making yeah. more money in multifamily than I was in my W-2. And, you know, I, I think for a lot of people, the moment becomes obvious, you know, the, the moment becomes obvious, whereas at least it did for me. And it sounds like it did for you, but you know, on, on the flip side, I think you said something important as well. Hold on, you know, hold on for a while. Don't, don't go too early. It's, it's nice getting that W2 paycheck. It's nice having a little bit of stability because the multifamily paychecks come sometimes come in big clumps, you know? So it's, it's a little yeah. different. Well, cool. Thanks for that. So let's talk once again. We we always I always ask uh, people about big burning whys, and you've come on twice now with your big burning why. And I don't quote me on this. I think the first time it was probably something about, "Gosh, I want to get rid of my W two." But you're you're gone. <laughs> All right. So yeah. I'm going to ask you something slightly different. What is your why now, and how has it changed? You know, over the last couple of years. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think you're spot on with yeah. probably what it, I don't remember exactly either, but what it was, mm -hmm. you know, the first time, the second time, I think I had clarified my why a little bit better. And that was mm -hmm. the same why I have today, which is run the race well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I just moved recently, but Brian will remember in my, my old house, I had a bunch of like marathon mm -hmm. pictures yeah. and stuff up on the wall mm -hmm. uh, because running is my hobby. I like to do runs and triathlon stuff like that. And so for me, what I realized as I was kind of searching for my why is there were kind of a lot of things that played into it. You know, mm -hmm. yes, I wanted financial freedom to be the best, you know, husband, family member that I could be. Yes, I wanted to serve my community better. Yes, I wanted to live my life to the fullest potential. But I realized kind of all that was encapsulated in this idea of running the race well. Mm -hmm. And so I, I see life as kind of like a race, right? There's no do-overs. There's no time out. It's just you're going and every moment counts that you have. And so one day when my race is over, I want to look back and say, wow, I did the most of my life that I was able to. I had the biggest impact that I was able to have. And so as far as the question of like what's different today from say a year ago, I would say it's just like the flames got hotter, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I'm more intentional. I wake up every day. I'm so careful about how I use my time. Because I realize like it's it's limited. And, and so now, you know, I do what I need to for my business, but I also try to prioritize what I want to do to have an impact, right? Yeah. Whether it's, you know, helping others, being there for my family, volunteering in my community, whatever it might be. So yeah, yeah absolutely. Love it. So you're running the same race. You're a little further ahead and uh, hopefully running a lot faster now. So yeah, nice, nice. Streamlined a lot of stuff going on. So awesome. I appreciate that. And it's, you know, it's something that talk about the the whys and how it's changed. I mean, for the longest time, you know, my, my why was the same thing. I want to be able to leave my W2. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to be able to, and then there was, there's more to it than that. But once I left my W2, I probably had, you know, a six month period where I, I had to sit back and really think about, What's my new why? You know, what what yeah. is it? You know, what's different? I, I like how you you put that. I want to, you know, look back on my life and have run the race well. You know, I, I want to look back and say, yeah, I, I gave it my all at every point. And so I think there, there's a lot of wisdom to that. Cool. All right. So let's start talking. Let's talk about a deal. Pick your first, pick your favorite, whichever one you want to talk about today and tell us, tell us the type of stuff that uh you, you do. 
Yeah. So we'll talk about um, one of them that, that I was the lead sponsor on. So mm -hmm. my deals are about 50, 50. I have a group of partners that I typically work with and mm -hmm. some of them I've been the lead sponsor on and other of them I've co GP'd on, which is more of a, let's call it an assisting role in the mm -hmm. syndication. Right. Yeah. Um, and so we did a deal. It was our, our last deal of 2021. That was a, an A minus deal in college station. And we found it off market through a broker relationship that mm -hmm. I never really suspected was going to bring me a deal, but did. It was just really cool because it yeah. was like seeing everything come full circle, right? Mm -hmm. The broker relationship, the investors that had already invested in our previous couple of deals, mm -hmm. and then just our ability to pull a business plan together and execute on it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I can go into as, as deep as you want, but high level, mm -hmm. um, it was mom and pop ownership. They didn't even have a website for the property okay. in a college town. A-class a um, properties will almost always have websites, you know? Your yeah. C-class a lot of times, I mean, and, yeah. but yeah, your well, A-class almost always do. And, and it's funny because even today, my criteria to brokers is we really like B, but maybe we'll buy C-plus is kind mm -hmm. of our, our yeah. criteria, right? So when they said A-minus, I was like, it's too expensive. I'm not going to buy it. And the broker was like, look. All I'm asking is take 20 minutes and underwrite it and just mm -hmm. take a look because I think this could be a good deal. Mm -hmm. And so I listened uh, and took the time to underwrite it. And I was like, oh my goodness, it actually is. And basically we close based on, on multiple BOVs, broker opinions of value. We closed mm -hmm. on that deal with a million dollars of equity day one. So yeah. Yeah, that's, that's healthy. I mean, if, if you can do that, I, I do that eight times a week, you know, every day and yeah. on Sunday, but uh, yeah, I mean, you can walk in with a million dollars of equity. I mean, your investors win, you win. It's, that's like an immediate impact to everybody's net worth, you know? So right. love it. Love it. Now, a minus. So let, let's, let's talk a little bit about the difference. I mean, you, you say you're, you're, you typically like, you know, maybe a C plus, but stick to the B. How, how's your, how are the operations gone since? And, and what's your experience with that versus, you know, your experience with either a C class or a B class? How are they different? In case I may have already mentioned it, but this property, it's located in College Station, Texas, which is where Texas, Texas A&M and &M is, right? Mm -hmm. And so a very large student population. Yep. Now, our property is not a student housing property. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we don't rent by the bed. We have 12 month leases, but we do have a lot of students who live on the property, if that yeah. makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about the kind of student that goes to A&M mm -hmm. that's going to rent a property that's, say, you know, 30 to 40 percent higher rent than what yes. they could find a quarter mile away. Right. Yep. And so I would say it's like you, you think about a class as being like, OK, it's going to be low maintenance. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not going to be as much work with tenants. And I would say it's it's different. So mm -hmm. yeah, we don't have delinquency on our property. Mm -hmm. We've had one month of bad debt in our entire time of ownership across yeah. two years. That's it. Gosh. But we have but we have parents of students who will call the moment that something is like broken at the property, right? And obviously wow. I don't get those calls as a syndicator, but I hear about them through our property management and yep. sometimes have to sit there, hear the stories and empathize a little bit during mm -hmm. our, our asset management calls. So yeah. that's one difference. I would say the other one is just the stuff on the property is nicer. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when, when your XYZ part breaks, instead of $2, it's $4. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's another big thing that, that I've noticed. But overall, it's been it's been great. I like you said, I'd buy eight a week if I could. But yeah, it is a little bit different for sure. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for bring, bringing that out. And when you, when you talked about you know the college campus, you know the first thing that came to my mind is that the parents are paying for the rent. You know the parents are you know co-signing and whatnot. And I mean I've got two kids that are in Salt Lake, and I've co-signed on a couple of of, of those. But uh, fortunately, I don't pay for them. But yeah, I, I, that's immediately where my mind went. It's like, okay, yeah. Parents are paying for it. Yeah. And they, they probably drive nicer cars than we do. So um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's, so. let's put it this way. When I went to A&M, mm -hmm. I did, I, I lived on the other side of the tracks, right? So <laughs> it was a little bit different, you know? Yeah. 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 I, I piled into a small C-class apartment with, you know, three of my closest friends, you know, and it was, yep. yeah, it was, Far enough away from campus where walking was painful, you know, but uh, anyway, that's a whole, whole different, whole different class of 
people than what we're used to. But uh, hopefully for my younger kids, you know, I may 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 not be able to, you know, put the the bill for my older kids right now. But my my younger kids might get it. But uh, <laughs> all right. So let's see. We talked about your background. We talked about your why. We talked about a property. Okay, one question left, and that's what's next for you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I see 2023 is like our comeback year, right? Mm -hmm. I already mentioned, you know, last year was a challenging year and it was for everyone, but we were very disciplined about our acquisitions yep. and both in 2021 and 22. And so we're very blessed that today we don't have a lot of the headaches that many sponsors do with, you know, yeah. floating rate dead and pausing distributions and staying awake at night, worried about deals. We have none of that. Um, yeah. So I'm very grateful for that you know, it's, it's full steam ahead, foot on the gas. Um, so we're, we're looking for deals and I think it'll be a great year to scale. You know, we're, we're at the beginning of a new cycle. Awesome. And so, you know, as long as you buy right, there's, there's nowhere to go, but up. Yeah. And I, I feel the same way. I think 2023 is going to be a banner year. So I'm excited for it. So, all right, we're going to shift gears and bring on Tyler. So Tyler, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. It's awesome. Do us a favor. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. So, you know, my name is Tyler Smith. I am from New York City. I primarily work in the transportation industry. So mm -hmm. I work for DHL, some freight forwarders, okay. um, some trucking companies, some various trucking companies. Uh, so that's pretty much where my kind of niche is. I just figured that I would translate and try to bring over those successes in the transportation industry over to the real estate industry. Yeah. It, it's sort of the same ball where mm -hmm. it's a relationship business. Yeah. You know, um, you do right by others. You, you, you move with integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you'll be successful. That's what's, that's what's gotten me su mm -hmm. the success that I have in the transportation yeah. industry. And I think that's what's going to yeah. you know, transfer to real estate. I love it. I mean, there there's certain things of, of just about every every job that will translate. You know, some sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly. You know, but uh, you know, things that make you successful in in one walk of life typically are going to help you be successful in others. We actually talked about that in episode I recorded yesterday with Alex Tam. That exact same subject, but uh, yeah, yeah. Take take what you've you've done well with, and you know, apply it to multifamily, and you're going to do well here too. So. Um, so you're you're working DHL, you're New York City. Why are you looking at multifamily now? What's what's giving you the bug? Yeah, so it's it's so funny, right? Like mm -hmm. during the pandemic, I've read about three, maybe more books than I should have on multifamily <laughs> <laughs> while we had that like uh, yep. pause in the world. Mm -hmm. And I just got so into it uh, in, in mm -hmm. terms of the flexibility it gives you. The, the, yeah. the elevation it can possibly you know give your life and your your family along yeah. with that right yeah. so I, I, and even if we backtrack way back like to when mm -hmm. sims was around mm -hmm. <laughs> so always playing yeah. those little building games yeah. and i see myself as like a creator not necessarily on the contractor side but like mm -hmm. the vision behind yeah. the, the I mean, building work you know? Don't don't tell anybody, but I've got one of those, uh, you know, installed on my computer. But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think they're fun, you know. And I, I, I put a lot of really nice, you know, multifamily units up next to, you know, on the waterfront. You know, I have my A class areas and my C. Yeah, I do it. It is kind of fun to do. <laughs> yeah, I figured why not do it in real life? Yeah, yeah do it in real life. Absolutely. So, um, well, cool. I mean, now. Okay, let's take that one step deeper and, and go into what I call the big burning why, you know, so take the reason you're moving into go one step deeper, deeper and what, what really motivates you? So I think what drives a lot of mm -hmm. my decisions in life, all they, they all factor around the two F's. So mm -hmm. it's family and freedom. Yeah. So and I think it intertwines uh, a lot, you know, you, you have a lot more freedom to, to spend with family. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I think and if I were to go a little deeper. Uh, I think that this is a big, this is a big dream, right? Like you mm -hmm. don't just wake up and, and do this overnight, right? So I think, I I think I, I want to dream big and actually put the work in to, you know, attain the goals that I set out for myself. And like, yeah. I have smaller cousins that would be inspired by, you know, if I were to mm -hmm. pull off like mm -hmm. this game that we're in right now. So 
you know, other than them wanting to be basketball players and football players and, you know, the, yeah. <laughs> the fun stuff like this, this is obtainable as well, you know, so yeah. I want to be like a model uh, yeah. for those younger, those younger kids in my family. Yeah. Now you, you misspoke slightly. You said, if this works out, you know, when, okay. When this yes. works for you. Okay. Yes. yes. No other option. Okay. When okay. this works for you. So when I said, if like it kind of, I felt like a ping in my brain, like, yeah. you, know, I, <laughs> you know, it's, it's amazing how, you know, just changing, making, making little subtle changes like that, you know, changes your mindset too. You know, yeah. if, if you, if you can force yourself to stay, say when, instead of if, I mean, the first couple of times it's hard, but man, it's, I, I've made like little subtle changes like that to, to my my vocabulary and it makes a ton of difference but uh when you know so when i own you know 2000 5000 10000 units in salt lake city is what i'm looking at not if because it's going to happen but uh and tyler it's going to happen for you as well but all right so here comes my favorite part of the episode tyler we got jonathan on the line what do you want to ask him Jonathan, I want to ask you questions, I guess, like in succession, just based off of what you said a couple of times in, in the beginning, right? So what kind of pivots do you see from 2022 to 2023? You looking in different markets or what's the deal? It's a great question. So, and it's something we could talk about for an hour, but yeah. I think that before you talk about 22 to 23, you got to talk about 21 to 22. And so yeah. the previous two years, everyone was basically paying everything a property was worth and then some. You know, just very bullish on real estate with the hopes that like it would just continue and continue and continue. And, you know, provided those people got long term fixed rate debt, they're probably going to be fine. They may have to hold a little longer than what they wanted, but they'll be fine. If you look at the curves on an economic cycle, you get to that peak and then you start to come down. That's really what we started to see basically Q1 to Q2 of last year. Interest rates began to rise as the Fed was responding to inflation. And for us as investors, one thing that's a little different in the commercial world than the residential world is you don't lock rates when you go under contract on a property. You lock the rate right before you close, typically. Yeah. And so when you're putting in an offer, you're projecting what rate am I going to lock 60 to 90 days from now? For me, my background, I worked as an engineer. I'm a, you know, cross every T, dot every I kind of guy. And so, you know, I made very conservative guesses about where those rates were going to go, put in appropriate offers and would get, you know, maybe second, but more likely third, fourth, fifth place on offers. Mm -hmm. And then lo and behold, 30 to 45 days down the road, broker comes back. Hey, we'd love to take your offer at X dollars. Well, by then I've got to retrade a certain percentage lower, typically five to 10% lower, like a good percentage lower. And that was the story of the year. It was frustrating. It was demoralizing, but ultimately our very disciplined approach to underwriting landed us one really good deal and kept us out of a lot of trouble that other people had. So now to get to your question, which was, what are we doing today? We're starting to see the Fed level off on rates. So we're less concerned about things like floating rate debt, retrades from lenders, stuff like that, that we were last year. I think a lot of it today is, first of all, getting sellers at expectations of where today's prices are. Last year, it was extremely difficult, almost impossible. Now it's possible. You just got to find the right deal. And I think the second thing is rallying your investors. Mm -hmm. So investors are always going to be about as a whole, as a group, about two steps behind where you are as a syndicator. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're doing your job, you know what's going on in the market, you know where things are going, and you have to lead your investors along that path. And so now a lot of my job is talking to investors and saying, hey, actually, now is the time to get back in the game. Now is the time to be buying deals and looking back at historical times of like COVID, of previous recessions and saying, this is the point in the economic cycle to buy. So um, that's just kind of a couple of things I would say, being very disciplined on underwriting on deals and then, you know, pulling your investors along to make sure they're comfortable. Yeah. And I, I mean, everything he said, you know, agree, just a couple examples. I mean, we got a deal I closed was October. It was a small JV deal, 61 units, you know, three and a half million dollar purchase price. But when, when we got the deal under contract, you know, brokers were telling us the rates were five. And then as the contract goes on, you know, hey, now rates are at six. Now rates are, when we closed, we were at seven and a quarter. 
you know, and so there, there's a two and a quarter percent interest rate difference between the day the property was under contract and the day we closed. And this was a JV. There were four of us in it with our own personal money. And, you know, it was just like, man, we're getting close. We're getting close. We're getting close. And I mean, we rushed to close it before the next Fed meeting. I think we closed it like two days before the next time the Fed met because we didn't want our rate to go up anymore. But, you know, we went from pretty fat cash flow to, you know, our cash flow just kept on getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. And it was just like, does it still make sense to do the deal? And at the end of the day, we were really close to our red line, you know, and I think had we been bringing in investors in that one, we would have had kind of a, a harder, faster, or maybe a higher red line that we would have crossed a lot earlier. Second thing Jonathan mentioned that I'm going to double down on is the investors, you know, with information like the the economic information, what it was. I did a co-GP capital raise last year and I, there were a lot of people that were afraid of you know, a lot of people who were worried about losing their jobs, a lot of people who, you know, wanted to stay liquid, you know, a lot of people who were just people that normally would have invested without a problem were just like, you know, soft committing and dropping out because our company, you know, I, I got this once our company just did a round of layoffs. I don't know if I'm going to be next, you know, or um, a lot of things like that. So yeah, 22 was difficult. 23, I think a lot of those problems have just, like Jonathan said, a lot of them taken care of themselves investors are more willing to to do stuff now. So I have, yeah. I have two follow-up questions for you, right? So in terms of the rates and going on the contract, were you submitting LOIs with certain contingencies, like in, in terms of the rate or financial contingencies? And if so, like what, what kind yeah. of were you putting out? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Going back to a year ago in 22, the answer mm -hmm. would be no. And it's primarily because it was, and this is why most sponsors didn't do a lot of deals last year. You still had the disadvantages of a hot market, mm -hmm. but you had the disadvantages also of a slower buyer's type market. And so what do I mean by that? No, you could not put contingencies in your LOI a year ago, or you would be written off right off the bat. Like sellers had not come to that point where they were willing to accept offers. And there were other buyers out there still willing to put those in. And at the same time, you had to account for the problems of rates going up. And so mm -hmm. Our response to it was we have a mortgage broker. He's almost like a team member, right? And so we underwrote, I don't know how many deals with this particular mortgage broker. Yes, I keep a pulse on the rates all the time, but that's all he does all day long. Yeah. And so every offer we're putting in, we're saying, hey, where do you see these rates going? You know, what 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 should we be putting in the offers? What should we be underwriting at? You know? Um, what's a worst case scenario? And so that's kind of how we made sure that, that you know, we stayed true to where um, deals could, you know, still pencil out um, should rates go up a couple percent. Yeah. Um, so that was the answer. Today, though, just to, 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 to wrap up the question, we are seeing a lot of those contingencies come back, particularly in tertiary markets. So, um, you know, things like due diligence without hard money or less hard money. Um, is pretty commonplace now. And you would have never seen that a year or two ago. So now some of those contingencies are coming back into play. Yeah. We, we got a properties that we're looking at that we are getting contingencies on, you know, we are getting, um, you know, the seller expectations of prices have come down and, you know, a year ago or 18 months ago, you know, you had to have hard money day one and, you know, a second deposit 14 days in just to stand out and now it's, it's, I think it's back to the 1% EMD, you know, with a, a 30 day due diligence contingency. That's the offers that we're putting in and we've, we've gotten some of them accepted recently. So um, it is still by and large a seller's market though. I mean, that's, it still is a seller's market, unfortunately. Hmm. So it, it, another question is, have you now shift? Like, so mm -hmm. you see that now it's a seller's market, right? And you're, uh, market is as Dallas, right? Have you shifted your market at all? Like to, I see some people start to say mm -hmm. that Midwest is a market that might be, mm -hmm. you know, shining in, in the next two to three years or so. Yeah, it's a great question. I would say that we, we haven't changed markets. So our, our group Apogee Capital, we buy um, deals both in Texas and Oklahoma with Texas being a little bit more of an appreciation based market and Oklahoma being a little more of a cash flow market. 
Um, what I would say is our, our investments in Oklahoma have really stood out during this time. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I have friends who, and, and I love our hometown here. I would buy deals here for sure, but, but, you know, they'll be doing a deal and like have, let's say 4% cash flow across a five-year business plan. And we're doing a deal that might have 7% cash mm -hmm. flow or higher. Right. And so, it's a lot of our investors really like that because they're getting half or their returns through cash flow. Um, so it's really highlighted some of the markets that maybe previously investors weren't quite as interested in. Um, another thing I would say is, and, and this is true across the board, I think regardless of your market, um, assumptions are, are back in style. Um, so when I started a syndicator, assumptions were this weird thing that no one did. And you know, if you had yeah. to sell, it was an assumption you were going to get a low price. Well, now it's the exact opposite, right? Yeah. So we seek out deals with assumptions. Um, and there's a lot of them. The kicker is finding some that have enough leverage to make the deal good. Yeah. Um, and another thing I would say is is seller finance is something that's that's come back in style as well. Mm -hmm. um, we have not done any syndications with seller finance, but we've underwritten a lot of deals where sellers are saying, hey, I really feel like a year ago, two a year ago, my property is worth this. I don't want to sell it at today's prices. If I give you, you know, X percentage towards your equity, will you give me a higher price for my property? And so that's something that we're seeing on on a lot of deals now. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm seeing the same thing. Um, we're we're actually and and looking at when this is going to air. We should close before then, so I'm confident saying, yeah, we're working on a, a deal with a. Um, an, an assumption we're getting a 3.4 percent interest rate and we're coming in at about 60 low 60s on our LTV so you know I mean normally you know a lot of people try to kind of max out the leverage and go up to 75 it makes your numbers pop there's a little more risk to it but you know we're, we're actually our numbers look a lot better at you know low 60s LTV with a 3.4 percent than they do at you know a little bit higher leverage at you know high fives right now. So that's something that works. Um, I have talked to a couple of people that are also looking at seller finance deals. Yeah, it's it's what you do to make things work right now. But uh, um, let's see, if we if we got one quick question and answer, we got time for one more. So Tyler, if you got one more quick one, let's, let's hit it. Sure. Yeah, this one's a quick one. This one is uh, pretty much for my team, right? So mm -hmm. in, in my business, right, transportation, speed wins the business. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can... Mm -hmm. Do things very quickly. You, more than likely, uh, that that customer is gonna gonna ship with you, yep. right? So, in terms of uh, an LOI, right? So, from what's the turnaround time from when you receive the complete financials from a broker uh, to submitting an offer? Uh, you know, do you have boots on the ground as well, and that makes it a little more easier? Uh, but what is the turnaround time uh, from mm -hmm. financials Good. to offer? Good question. I'll try not to give a long-winded answer, but I, I hope it'll be helpful. So when I was in school for the longest time, I struggled with multiple choice tests. I hated them until one day someone gave me advice that rather than trying to solve the problem and get the right answer, figure out which ones were wrong and mark those off and, and basically use a process of elimination approach yeah. to get to the right answer. And so I would tell you, do the same thing with deals that are coming your way. If the deal doesn't fit your criteria, whatever that is, throw it out. Mm -hmm. When you're underwriting a deal, oftentimes you can get a pretty good idea of like, okay, these are going to be my expenses. This is going to be my debt. You know, maybe my rent bumps can be $75, maybe $125. I'll throw in $100 and just see, does the deal remotely work? Because if you throw all that in and say 20 minutes and then you're, you know, negative cash flowing on the deal, you probably know that, hey, this one isn't for me and you can just throw it out. So I would say take a process of elimination approach yeah. and then the deals that pass that initial test then go into like a full underwrite on them um, and, and spend time on them. Yeah, I, I would say the other part of that is have a good conversation and a good relationship with your broker. You know, if the broker is sending you a deal, if it's if it's an off market pocket listing and you're the first person to see it, you want to turn that as quick as you can. You want to have an offer on that table as quick as you can so you can lock that up. Provided, like Jonathan said, it's not one of those deals that you're like, okay, this doesn't meet my criteria. All right. So, 
you know, from, from one aspect, you know, that that's what you're looking to do. Um, but there, there are some deals where the brokers, you know, they, they have a call for offer dates, you know, and they have all, everything else, you know, so sometimes they're going to, they're going to dictate a timeline to you. And if they say, Hey, here's the deal, you know, full marketed deal, you know, today is, you know, and call for offers is three weeks from now, you've got time to go through a little bit more. So I don't think there's a hard, fast answer, but I, I do think that, you know, if there was a hard, fast answer, it's it's shorter turnaround time is better. Simple. Yeah. All right. We are out of time. One last question for each of you. Jonathan, you get to go first. How can listeners learn more about you? Yeah, absolutely. As you know, I'm Jonathan Nichols. My wife's Paula. Our company's called Apogee Capital. You can check out our website, which I'm sure will be in the show notes. Yep. We have an ebook all about passive investing on there that might be of interest and a lot of other resources that might be of interest to active investors too. I'm also very active on LinkedIn if you want to reach out to me and send me a message there. Awesome. All right. And Tyler, same question for you. Go ahead. Yeah, my name is Tyler Smith. Uh, the company is Shones Investments. That's S-H-O-N-E-S Investments. Uh, you can reach us at the www shonesinvestments.com. I'm very active on Instagram. That Instagram is venture.shones, S-H-O-N-E-S. Okay. Venture.shones. Awesome. Cool. Cool. Well, Hey, thanks guys for your time. Very much appreciate it. And we will put all that stuff in the show notes for anybody who's listening. So you want to contact either of these gentlemen, hit up the show notes, you know, tap the appropriate link and give them a whirl. So all right. Well, okay, cool guys. Once again, thanks for coming on and let's get some deals done in 2023. Hey, if you like that episode, make sure to subscribe. But more importantly, if you haven't joined our multifamily educational community yet, which we call a tribe of Titans, you are missing out. Get 30 days free by clicking the link in the description to this episode or go to the tribe of Titans.info and we'll see you there.